Uh, I've already told you that uh, you get in part 15 tonight, part 14 next week. Uh, uh, when I was doing this lesson, there was some things that I realized as I was working on it uh, yesterday and today that, uh, you know, I've grown in my walk with the Lord over the, since the last time I taught this many years ago. And I look at some things differently now. And, and this lesson was one of those that that happened to, uh, especially on this, how to pray about your problems. And, um, and so I might highlight, so I won't probably go in real deep detail with it, but because uh, I, I still want to get you out here by 8 if I can. Uh, if not, then you can leave and I'll finish it. But anyway, um, uh, but uh, it was just interesting that that was one of those things that happened to me. That when I got to certain things that, that I no longer look at them the same way. That's why the word is a, a living word, because you grow and it grows in you. Uh, Brother, would you read that a passage of scripture that was supposed to be the last passage? <laughs> so 13 through 20. Now Psalm 109 eight is not part of it, right? Okay. You can make it part of it. When you go home, look it up, you'll know how funny that is. So this is called the prayer of faith. Is any one of you in trouble? They should pray. Is anyone happy? Let them sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? They should call the elders of the church to pray over them and anoint them with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise them up. If they have sinned, they will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Elijah was a man just like us. He prayed earnestly that it would not rain, and it did not rain on the land for three and a half years. Again he prayed, and the heavens gave rain, and the earth produced its crops. Brothers and sisters, if one of you should wander from the truth, and someone should bring them back, remember this. Whoever turns a sinner from the error of their way will save them from death and cover over a multitude of sins. Wow. Isn't that a powerful pack? Mm -hmm. That's a lot packed in that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So let's unpack some of it tonight. Uh, just start with that 16th verse where it says that, uh, you know, the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The word prayer is mentioned seven times in that passage that he just read. And I think that's because uh, James is trying to impress upon us there is tremendous power <laughs> in prayer. Uh, prayer is not only the greatest privilege uh, of, but it's the greatest power in a Christian's life. Uh, being able to talk to God. And, and my mom, Liam, can testify that really believe that. I mean, she just really believed it. She didn't have no formula, honey. Anytime she wanted to talk to the Lord, she just started talking to him. We, sometimes it embarrassed us because she'd be walking down the street and people would be looking at her. <laughs> but it didn't bother Mama one bit because she believed in the power and the privilege of talking to God. And so in this lesson, uh, we're looking at when should I pray, what kind of person can pray, and how can I pray more effectively. That's what we're going to concentrate on. Uh, when should I pray? James, uh, in this passage, these seven verses, uh, mentions there are three specific times when I really do need to pray. And the first one is when I'm hurting emotionally, I need to pray. When I'm hurting emotionally, I need to pray. Verse 13 says, is there anyone troubled? Any one of you in trouble, he should pray. Uh, James is talking about an internal distress here caused by external circumstances. Uh, and above, in verse 12, he says, Above all, my brothers and sisters, do not swear. You know, when you're under um, tension, that's when you're tempted to swear. Isn't it? Mm -hmm. uh, all of us been there, amen? amen. Anybody not been there? 
uh, uh, he's been tempted to lie. <laughs> <laughs> because when you have stress in your life, there is two alternatives, prayer or swear. Some of us put them together even. <laughs> right? Verse 13 or verse 12, one or the other. And right underneath that, he says, if anyone happy, let that one sing songs of praise. Again, when I was doing it, I was thinking of my mama. Leah, what did mama do when she was happy? Sing. That girl was start of a song, once again, much <laughs> to our detriment. Uh, you know, you're walking down the street in Martin, this woman starts singing out loud. And then she'd get happy. I mean, when I mean happy, she'd get caught up in the spirit. And started praising the Lord on the street, and you just keep on walking like you know, <laughs> this one. But then she'd come out and call you by name. <laughs> Am I lying? <laughs> I mean, that woman was like that. She was just like that. But being a Christian, but you know what? Think about it. Being a Christian should be contagious, should. That's right. I mean, why is it that you go to church? You why did we go to football game? We were rooting for Bama and whatever you're rooting for. Some of you might root for that tech school on the plane, but you know, <laughs> just jumping up and down. I come to church and sit like this. That's the truth. Being a Christian should be contagious. It ought to be fun to go to church. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, when you're happy, you sing. James uh, said it's valid to be happy. You know, the word praise is found something like 550 times in the, in the Bible. And it's supposed to be the lifestyle of a Christian. I, you know, that's why I can't stand John Hagee. Have you ever, you even know who John Hagee is? He's one of those guys that come on TV, big old fat guy, uh, much bigger than me. I mean, he's about like that. And he stomps around the state. Whoa, 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 whoa. I'm the meanest Christian I've ever seen in my life. And I'm thinking, if the joy of the Lord is your strength, why don't you tell your face? <laughs> Some of them sitting up in your congregation too. You know, to be happy, or at least have joy, which is much deeper and much more satisfying than happy. And so if you want a rich, personal, devotional life, nothing has done more for my personal life than singing to the Lord. You know, and, and as a matter of fact, um, anybody that's been in my house know that sometimes when I ain't got nothing else to do, I'll just cut, I'll go to YouTube. I've introduced them to a lot of songs that way. Go to YouTube and just listen to good old black gospel. Mm -hmm. And honey, and sometimes I just get up and shout right there in my office at home. <laughs> you should have seen, we won't call no name, a couple few Sundays ago, I thought one little verse, and that, that boy was going to be running <laughs> around the church. He was about ready to take off. Get him. I mean, he was just a bouncing over there. <laughs> that's how it's supposed to be in the church. That's right. Amen? Amen. Amen. When I'm, and, and so, when I'm hurting, and I need to get up, and when I'm, especially when I'm hurting the most, I need to pray and praise because they go together, right? A second time I need to pray is when I'm hurting physically. When I'm hurting physically. Um, verse 14 and 15 says, Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer offered in faith will make the sick well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sin, he will be forgotten. The word sick right here in, in Greek literally means without strength. That's what it means, without strength. This ain't talking about a little post-nasal drip here, okay? He, that's not what he's talking about here. He means you're totally wasted. He means you're fatigued. You're bedridden. And, and this is not just acid. It's just, although I don't see anything wrong with praying for those things either. Amen? Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is what he says. He's a call for the elders of the church. You know who the elders of the church in this year? Uh, it's not just the old folks. <laughs> It's the staff, the board, the prayer team, anybody uh, that you that that you uh, look up to spiritually. That's the, that's who the elders of the church is. Anybody you look up to spiritually, call on them, and and and, and we'll come with all. Amen. Amen. And we'll anoint you. Uh, and, 
and pray over you with all. Now, as I was thinking about this this uh, the last couple of days, there is a lot of bad teaching out there about healing. A lot of diversity out there um, about sitting. And I, I want And right here is where I have really changed some of my thinking. Uh, the Bible really talks about three kinds of sicknesses. Three kinds of sickness. Uh, the first sickness is a sickness of death. A sickness for death. Uh, if you want to look and find out uh, 1 John 5, 16 and John 11, 4. If you, uh, did I put those down there? You can look them up. Man. Uh, you can look them up when you get home along with Psalm 109. Uh, but, but anyway, um, This, when he talks about the sickness, that this is the kind of sickness that God allows to take you out of here. Mama's cancer was one of those. Uh, what are, uh, there are some sicknesses people don't, for whatever reason, some people can recover from and others don't. In that case, it was meant to take them out of here. And the reason being is, you know, you wouldn't live, you, you do know you weren't meant to be here forever. I know that's a shock to some of y'all. Um, but you would never meant to, God designed this body that you live in to be here on this earth forever and definitely on this plane that we know of anyway. and so and besides that if every sickness could be healed by faith then anybody who had a lot of faith would never die right if you look at it like we all know that ain't true don't we uh, there are sicknesses that lead to death and then there's a sickness for, dis for discipline this is where my thinking has really changed over the years. Uh, it's kind of, when I did this years ago, I, th I, I thought of, and, and so I used it here, uh, I thought of the example from 1 Corinthians. Uh, if any of you are familiar with it, it's about the communion. And it's about Paul talking about um, people taking the communion unworthy. And, and of course, preachers have taught really bad theology around taking the communion unworthy. And what Paul was talking about had nothing to do with what you hear about in church. Um, communion in the early church was centered around the love feast. The love feast was that meal once a week that was prepared for widows and children. And what ticked Paul off was that all these old men would come in and eat up all the best food and drink up the best wine, and wine was served because you didn't want to drink the water at the least back then or now, okay? And that's what he was talking about when he was talking about taking it unworthy. And he was so mad, he said, that's why some of you are sick. <laughs> you are taking the Lord's Supper unworthily. Now, and they have, people have taken that and extrapolated today to mean that that's the reason people are sick because they did something wrong. And I don't believe that's true. I no longer believe that. Um, yeah, I think they did something wrong and that's why they're sick, but I don't believe God did it to them. Okay? I think the lesson Paul was trying to treat, teach about sickness for discipline is that there are always consequences to your actions. There's consequences to your acting. If, if you're not doing it in God's will, guess what? Things are going to go wrong. And one of the things that can go wrong is you get sick. We just had a great meal. Praise the Lord, Steve and Jennifer and Tammy. But it's not God's will for us to overindulge in eating all the time. And you'll not only make you fat like me, <laughs> but it can lead to all kinds of illnesses and kill you. And the point of it is, uh, this sickness for discipline is if you overindulge, even on food, it can bring sickness in your life. It isn't that God's out to get you, but your consequences have action. You understand what I'm going? You understand what I'm saying? Nod your head if you understand what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. Don't make me have to pull a little amen. <laughs> If we, if we abuse our bodies, guess what? We get sick. Mm -hmm. We just get sick. Um, um, the day after I preached, um, the day I preached uh, the, uh, my class reunion, 
my cousin, my cousin who owns a catering service, they had food galore, and it was good. And even, they also catered the family reunion. It was good too. What you to me? <laughs> Praise the Lord. And um, and of course, we had the desserts out of the wazoo. Yeah. <laughs> and um, I kind of partake in many of them. Yeah. <laughs> and by Monday, after I preached on Sunday, I, my sugar shot up. And I was sick all day. Now, who did that card? <laughs> no. JR. You ain't got no business eating seven desserts. <laughs> but you know that was so cute. <laughs> and readily available. Were they what size were they? Were they was it really fourteen desserts when you <laughs> was it double portion? <laughs> Ushers. <laughs> My point is there is a sickness for discipline. It has nothing to do with whether God's out to get you. If you don't do what you're supposed to, you get sick. Uh, my cousin's daughter has sickle cell anemia. Uh, and, um, and she has, and, and lupus. And she has to take this, this drug, this, these drugs. They are steroids. And she's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And she, so she stopped taking them. Uh, because she was making her. And guess what? Uh, Francis had to rush her to the hospital in Rome. And, and, and the doctor, and the doctor said, what's going on? And she said, I don't know. And he said, yes, you do. And what's wrong now? And why are you not taking your medicine? Well, she stopped taking them because they were making them too big. And he looked at her and said, you can be big and alive, or you can be skinny and in a court and a coffin. It's your choice. Mm -hmm. You understand what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Sickness for discipline. It's not that God's out to get you. Yeah, I used to think that uh, I would, we we they told us that you know mm -hmm. uh, all that old bad theology. It's not, that's not true. It's it's just the law of consequences that's going on like that. Sickness for discipline. The third one, of course, is. There comes a sickness for the glory of God, and that one's even worse. The teaching on that one's even worse. I had to change my mind on that one too. And the, but the thought behind the sickness for the glory of God is that God has allowed this in your life to uh, simply bring glory to God. God never, you know, uh, God has allowed it because God wants to heal you so you can be a testimony. Haven't you all heard that kind of nonsense? Uh, uh, people will point to John 11. Oh, you know the the guy who uh, brought to Jesus who's blind and and uh, and the disciple asked, Master, who sinned here? His parents or him? And God says, and Jesus said, nobody sinned. This this sickness is for the glory of God. And so Jesus heals the guy, and it, and it brought glory to God. <coughs> Let me just say something about this. I think that was a healing in spite of and not a healing because of. Everybody follow me? Mm -hmm. I don't believe anyone sinned because that man, man to be blind. I believe that, you know, for whatever it, reason, there is forces at work that, it, that causes diseases and all that stuff and all that stuff. And, 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 but God chose to, on this day, heal that guy who was the result of it to demonstrate God's power and God's glory. And God still can do that even today. But I do not believe that God made somebody blind from birth and they walk around for all these years just so God can heal them and get glory. That's about like that dumb idea of, you know, a baby dies and someone said, God just needed another flower in his God. That is bull. <laughs> That's bull crap, yes. Uh, I don't believe that nonsense for moment because if God wants another flower of God, God can grow anything. You don't have to kill a baby. That's right. Okay? And so I believe when you hear about sickness for the glory of God, it's a healing in spite of, not because of. 
You see the difference in the two? Shake your head like this if you're okay. Thank you. <laughs> so those three kinds of sickness the Bible talks about. You know, the sickness for death, sickness for discipline, and sickness for the glory of God. And you can see my theology has changed a great deal around that over the years. Now there's a lot of different um, divisions and, and a lot of uh, different versions and diversity around the whole idea of attitudes toward healing. Now, I just want to share five of them with you very quickly. Um, and it's not long. Five attitudes about healing. You have the sensationalist. That's the first one. The sensationalist. Uh, the long word is S E N S A T I O N A S L I S T. Um, these are the people you tend to see on TV. You, you know what I'm talking about? Uh, they come into town, hold these giant meetings. Uh, in large auditoriums <coughs> and advertising miracles, often the healer is very flamboyant. Born. He shouts at people, he slaps them upside the head, they fall over and all that kind of stuff. And it's a very highly charged and emotional atmosphere. And, 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 and this really is a psychological motivation in all of this. And I just want to say to you, be careful and be discerning when you see that kind of stuff. Now, I believe God can heal in those situations. I really do. Uh, because God can do anything. Uh, I think of, what's that, Benahian? Benahian, yeah. Uh, I think he's as funny as an Undertaker's Get Well card. I really do. But I also be, believe that people get healed at his uh, crusades and stuff. You know why? Not him. At their own faith. And, but what he does do is he create an atmosphere of faith that produces, even even through his stupid antics, uh, that welcomes for some people, opens up some people to the possibility of being healed. I do believe that. Um, and, uh, otherwise, it wouldn't happen. But God could heal them anywhere if they if that was opened up to them. Uh, I still say be very discerning towards it, even though I believe that people that can get healed. I don't believe as many people get healed. They say get healed. But, um, and the reason I don't believe, I, I say be very discerning, is that Jesus didn't manipulate people. Okay? And Jesus didn't use people for show. These folks are using people for show and manipulate people. Jesus cared more about their needs than he did about making an impression on the ground. Okay? And so he healed people. Most of the time he healed people quietly. Yeah. Remember, a lot of times he would tell them, go and don't tell nobody. Remember the leper? Yeah. He said, don't tell nobody. He went off telling everybody. He wouldn't he just didn't listen to you. But you see the difference there? I, so if, if they can open somebody's avenues to believe that they can be healed and, and their faith is such, uh, it can happen. But don't put no stock in that food running around on stage. That's somebody whose faith has opened them to the possibility of name. By the way, let me just say this. Just because something's a miracle don't mean it's from God. <laughs> Remember when Moses laid his stick down there and became a serpent in front of Pharaoh? What did the Egypt, Egypt priests do? They did the same thing. Remember he laid that, that stick down and became a serpent? And they said, What's that? We can do that. They just pissed their stick off and they became serpents too. So just remember, just because something's done in the name of the Lord doesn't mean it's of God. Okay? Uh, Jesus said in Matthew 7, many will come in that day and say, Lord, Lord, we did so many miracles in your name. And Jesus was, I didn't even know you. <laughs> <laughs> so one attitude right here that comes from the sensation. Another one comes from the confessionalist. You know the confessionalist is? The confessionalist, you probably know them, you just don't know what, the, you don't know them by this name. These are those people always say, God, it's always God's will to heal everybody. These are the name it and claim it folks. You know? Uh, today they're called word faith teachers. People often mistake these, these folks for Pentecostals, and they are not Pentecostals. We grew up in the Pentecostal church. I know the difference. 
Uh, these are charismatics. These are not Pentecostals, okay? Uh, and uh, and there's a, they're a bit different than the two ancient system. Uh, the they teach that sickness is a result of sin, and all you need to do is claim your healing, and God will heal you. Uh, how many of that worked for so far? Uh, now, let me tell you something. Paul did say, call forth that which is not as though it was. But what he was talking about is a healthy anticipation of what could be. Okay? And, and so that you, what can be, uh, it was never meant to be where you beat yourself up if it didn't happen. These people leave people guilty mm -hmm. if they don't get healed. Because yeah. they teach, it's just your lack of faith that you didn't get healed. And the result is, if there's no healing, these people are full of guilt. Maybe I just didn't believe in that. Maybe my faith ain't strong enough. And, 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 and let me tell you something. False doctrines always create false guilt. Always. And you see, that's the problem with legalism. When you, when you make up all these rules and you make up all these regulations, it takes the joy out of being in a relationship with God. It takes a, the joy out of being in a relationship with God. Now, the Bible do says where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, not guilt. And confessionalists uh, say, you speak it, you get it. The problem is, that makes God a genie. Mm -hmm. Amen? Mm -hmm. What do you do when you run out of your three wishes? <laughs> That's all the genie gives you. I'm sorry. And all of a sudden, when you treat God as a genie, God is serving me. And God is serving my needs and my whims rather than me serving God. Uh, what about this verse in 1 Peter 5.19? Those who suffer according to the will of God. Now, I don't really understand all the implications of that particular verse right there. And my faith tells me there's something more here that I just don't understand about that verse. But the one thing I know, absolutely know is that that verse flies in the face of all those who blame the victim for their suffering. Amen? Maybe it was put there just for that. Okay? So that's the, what, confessionalist. The next one is the, um, he'll love this in his Catholic term, although he never heard it, dispensationalist. Let me tell you what dispensationalist is. By the way, dispensation, if you're waiting on the spelling, is D-I-S-P-E-N-S-A-T-I-O-N-L-A-I-S-T-S. Dispensationalists are those people who say, now, that was just the New Testament times, Brother Darrell. It don't work anymore. It ain't around anymore. Don't bother looking for those gifts. Um, it was great back in those days, but they're not here anymore. I have a problem with that thinking. Number one, I'm living witness of God's miracle healing power in my life on more than one occasion. When I was 13 years old, when I was playing with that little light. <coughs> And all that gas and those gas rags and that barrel, I flipped that thing and they went boom <laughs> and burnt off all my face and arm and stuff. And the doctor told Mama I'd never have my complexion again. Oh, have you ever had a burn where they pulled the dead skin off? That'll make you have religion. <laughs> Ooh, because they can't anesthetize that. And after three days, they were just pulling this stuff off. That's pain. That's real pain. Y'all thought y'all had pain. That's real pain. Number one, I've been the miracle. Number two, this is New Testament times. Mm -hmm. Until Jesus comes back, mm -hmm. it's New Testament times. Mm -hmm. Amen? And number three, I have a problem with that view because it's also how I stay 29. Hebrews 13, 8. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ is saying yesterday, today, and forever. <laughs> good enough for Jesus, good enough for me. But you see, if he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, why did it stop back then? Amen? <clears throat> Number four, 
of the rationalists. R A T O N A A L I S T. Um, these are the people who say it's all just in your mind. <laughs> it, it, if you're ill, it's because you think you're ill. I, those are the people I want to hit upside the head. That there's no pain there. Mm -hmm. If you don't think there's no pain, there's no pain there. <laughs> you know, it's just so still. And, and the whole idea is just deny it and you'll be okay. By the way, that's the teaching behind Christian science. Did you know that? I went to the, uh, to the Christian Science Church in Atlanta a short time, many, many years ago. I couldn't stay there because I didn't believe that stuff. <laughs> but anyway, actually what happened was, you know, I knew it wasn't Christian as far as what I knew. But, um, and they used to have these beautiful... Um, Violinist and, and, and pianist playing duo, do excellent off the stuff, and and it was beautiful. But I mean, you know, I, I knew what it was. But this one time, Kennedy Schultz, the pastor of the church, jumped up right after that. Hey, better than some old rugged cross, huh? And my blood just ran cold, and I got to go back. I never went back. <laughs> that just didn't work for me. Okay, but that's what they teach. It's all about here, and um, and. Um, one of the it's one of the exponents of positive thinking, uh, and that laps the. Don't get me wrong, I do believe in. Uh, the, I'm a proponent of positive thinking. Uh, I believe in the healing of the mind and so forth with some of those methods and so forth. But because the Bible does teach us a man is in his heart, so is he, right? So, but the rationalists take this to another level, and they said, uh, no matter what your problem is, it's all in your mind. Hey, if I got to tell that's not just in my mind. That's in my wallet. <laughs> I ain't got no money, okay? Uh, denying reality doesn't change the reality. That's what I'm trying to say there. Denying it will all go away. That's what they teach. And then the last one is, uh, in which I believe that James was, he was a realist. And you know what a realist, this is the shortest one I'm going to talk about. A realist says this. There are two facts that's true. One, God still heals today. And two, not everybody gets healed. <laughs> That's the realist. Uh -huh. And we know that that was real even in Jesus' teaching. We know that was real even in Jesus' teaching. So what does James has to say uh, we do when, we, when you're sick? Number one, he says, you should call the elders... Who does the calling? Person. The sick person does. Uh, if you're sick, you can't go to bed, you call for them, and they come to you. Uh, notice that you have, the sick people need to take the initiative. If you don't call the other church, how do they know? You'd be surprised how many people get uh, upset with uh, people at church, leaders at church, pastors, because they didn't come and preach for And I said, did you call them? Back? No. How did I know? Well, it was on Facebook. <laughs> like I'm going to watch everything on Facebook that's why I get my news right call for the elders of the church and pray over them the guy's probably in the bed so that's why he said pray over them and anoint them with oil all through the scripture oil is used as a, a symbol of the Holy Spirit and, and it isn't the oil that heals the oil is simply an aid to help build a person's faith and, uh, to believe in the power of prayer the emphasis is on the power of prayer, not on the oil, okay? Oil is just a symbol we use. And then it says, in the name of the Lord, God is the healer, not the person. Then he can't heal nobody. Okay? The name of the Lord, and when he says the name of the Lord, he's talking about the name of the Lord represents the character of, of God. All heal is based on the character of God, okay? And the results, of course, is, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick well. The Lord will raise him up. If he sin, he will be forgiven. Now, we prayed for them. We anointed them with oil. And over the years, we've seen miracles in this church. Joe is a miracle. You do know that Joe was supposed to be dead April last year. That's as long as they gave him. At most, he would have, from that, when he got that diet, you remember, uh, at most, three years. He's, he's on bar time. Um, 
They thought you was going to take you out. I thought it was. But God hadn't put a peer. God just put a comma. Don't ever put a comma where God, or don't ever put a peer where God put a comma. Okay? God gets the last word. Amen? Amen. And so, um, sometimes people prayed and God take. Sometimes we pay for people and they, they die. Like Cain. Hey, amen? Others, we pray and for some reason God healed. That should tell you something. It ain't about you. It's about God. And God makes those decisions. Uh, and we have to learn to accept the will of God. Amen? Because of Scripture. Okay, so all of that under that two. All right. Okay, number three. I need to pray when I'm hurting spiritually. This is going to get good. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Um, in Jesus' day, people always thought all healing was the result of sin. You know? Uh, a lot of these, that you and I still believe that. Uh, if you heal somehow, you're supposed to have got some sin in your life. Uh, and uh, but Jesus blew that idea out the water with the uh, with that um, in John nine, didn't he? When the guy who'd been blind and uh, he said nobody has sinned. You know what? When you think about that, thinking about illness, it's associate illness just with sin is one of the most cruel and unfair things to do to a person. You know, think a baby is born with birth defects. You know that baby ain't sin. That should tell you something, right? I mean, we live in a fallen world where there's germs and there's diseases and there's hurts and there's problems that are just a part of life. And things happen because ever since that little bite in the, in the garden, <laughs> Uh, nothing has gone right. And nothing has been perfect since, right? right? So why all this stuff is out there? Stop blaming victims and making them feel worse because they are sick. It's dumb. Now we do bring a lot of sickness on ourselves, don't we? I mean, you know, if I don't follow God's principles for this body, eventually this body will tell me, like those seven desserts. <laughs> if I don't sleep right, I don't eat right, I don't exercise, uh, ailments gonna come as a result. If you have shoulder replacement surgery and you don't do the therapy, what's gonna happen? <laughs> now did God do that to you, Paul? No, I never did <laughs> No, you didn't. But there'll be people who would blame God for that. Uh, you know? I mean <laughs> if I don't eat right, sleep right, and all those kind of stuff. It, it, uh, okay, if I don't listen to God's word where it tells me don't be anxious about anything but pray about everything and yet I just go out there and I wear and I fret about everything, I get anxious about everything, I'm going to get ulcers, high blood pressure, and sometimes worse. And I'm to blame for it, not God. If I allow resentment to build up in my life and doctors tell uh, you know, and doctors say, it ain't so much what you eat as what's eating you. Uh, resentment can take a toll on you. And you begin to feel it in your neck, in your back, and even when you place just a little bit lower. Amen? Mm -hmm. If I don't trust God and I allow these things to come in my life, there will be sin because resentment is a sin. Okay? So James said, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other. Do you know what? Sin, think of sin like this. Sin is an eclipse. Sin is the moon in an eclipse. There's God, and there's you, and there's sin. Sin is something that comes between you and God that blocks out God's warmth and love and all those things. It blocks out God's best of what God wants for your life. That's what sin does. It isn't that God goes anywhere. God didn't get mad with you and storm off and go anywhere. God's still there. But confession is that thing that allows that to move out. And it isn't so much that it moves out. It allows you to recognize that God didn't go anywhere. That God's love and grace and mercy and all that is still there. 
and, and you see, and, and, and that's what a lot of us don't, uh, don't, don't get. When we get our spiritual act together, we're not going to be perfect, okay? But we just begin to realize God's grace and God's mercy and God's peace and all those things showing up in our life. It isn't that we are a different person. We just recognize what will bring and lift those burdens out of our life. You see, we are whole. We are a spiritual, physical, emotional being. And when the spiritual being, uh, you know, we are a spiritual being in a physical body, bridged together with our emotions. And when the spiritual is out of kilter, it affects your emotion. And when your emotions are out of kilter, it affects your body. And that's why doctors call, talk about a psychosomatic illnesses. They are very real. It's just that they come over there. Okay? Why isn't everybody healed? I have no clue. And no, neither does any of these other fools out there pretend they do. Because all I know is that's God. That's God's department. God has the power to heal anybody God wants to heal. But for some reason, God didn't heal in every situation. Okay? And you know who, who who's a good example? The Apostle Paul. Remember, he had that thing that we don't know what it was, but he called it a thorn in the flesh. Mm -hmm. And he said, I sought the Lord thrice and three times to remove it from him. And God never did remove it to him. All God ever said to him was, i got a better plan for you. And Paul, the great Apostle Paul, who wrote so much of the Bible, walked around with his thorn in the flesh the whole time he was on earth. For some reason, God, you think if God healed, was going to heal everybody, surely Paul would have healed her. That should tell you something. You think maybe he was you trying to tell you something? Now, what is the condition for healing? This is the interesting thing. The condition for healing is confession. I don't know if I put that on there. Did I put that on there? No. I didn't put that on there. Before. I'll talk about the circle cut. But uh, it, it's confession. And, and, and the reality is we'd rather conceal and camouflage than confess, wouldn't we? <laughs> but you know what? It's so liberating to confess your sin, to get them out and open, to share them, uh, not just with the Lord, but with each other. Revealing your feelings is the beginning of healing. When somebody comes to me and tells me they're going to, I've never told anybody else this before in the world, I'm excited, I am so excited, not because of the gossip bag, yeah? because I know what this is going to do for me. I know what this is going to do. I know the burden. Uh, it, it's such a relief uh, not to carry that burden anymore. You get out and open. So you confess to each other. Uh, does that mean I get up and confess to the whole church? Not if you're smart. <laughs> <laughs> this is the principle of confession, the circle of confession. If it's a private sin, that's just between me and the Lord. That means I don't have to confess it to nobody but the Lord. That's who I confess it to. If it's a personal sin, it's between me and somebody else. And so I need to, it's between, Daryl, if it's, it was, if it's between me and Daryl, then I need to go to Daryl. I don't go to Ronnie and Liam and Judy and, and, and John. I go to Daryl. Okay, and then what? And, and, and if it's a, uh, I need to come to you. And if it's a public sin, then I need to apologize to I mean, if it happens to the church, it's, it ought to be done to the whole church. Listen, it says confess your sin, not broadcast. Okay? There's a difference. Okay. It, 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 if it involves somebody else, you go to that person. And But you know what? Above all that, there ought to be one person in your life. I don't know who it is. But you ought to be one person you can share everything with and know that you're going to be loved and accepted unconditionally. My mom was that for me. I, th I discovered she was that for me. That girl could keep a secret. Good. You. <laughs> that girl could keep a secret. Um, a verse in Job says, a man needs his friend most when he's down in God. In other words, what he's trying to say there is people need somebody to stand and walk with them in times of doubt, when they're doubting in their faith. And don't tell me all of us have been there. Okay? 
I often tell people, go, I often counsel people going through a very difficult time, uh, put yourself in the midst of people. This is a good message for this Sunday, back to church time. Put yourself in the midst of people who will love you and affirm you no matter what. And not people who want something from you, not somebody who just trying to get with you, but, but put yourself in the middle of people who will simply love you and affirm you while you're going through your period of doubt. Uh, when Christians really love each other, when Christians, you ought to have to lock the doors to keep people out. Amen? The Bible says, by this all people will know that you're my disciples if you have what? Love for each other. That's what counts. You know, in the New Testament, Christians count, uh, 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 confess to each other. In the dark ages, they confess to, pre uh, to priests. Freud said that you, can you should confess to uh, counselors. Protestants said, we're not going to confess to anybody. And that started a lot of problems right there. And a lot of hang ups that still exist today. So, when should I pray? James says, whenever you got a need, whether it's spiritual, emotional, or whatever. Who can, I pr who, who can pray? Any ordinary person. I can. Some people think you have to be spiritual giants to be praying for people and, and all that kind of stuff. No, you don't. And, and he gives us an example in the scripture of Elijah. And, and when people see that, they think of a spiritual giant. Elijah, because he defeated the foreign prophets of Baal. But, um, and, 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 and that makes people feel inferior. But listen to what he says there. Elijah was just a man like us. He prayed earnestly that it would rain, and it didn't rain on the land for three and a half years. He prayed again, the heavens opened up, and the earth produced his crops. Do you know when this happened? This happened right after the big God contest up on Mount Carmel. <laughs> when he took on the 450 prophets of Baal. And, and uh, he, you know, here he, 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 he wasn't afraid of 450 prophets of Baal, but he takes off running from the, because of the threat of a woman named Je Jezebel. Ain't that something? And in 1 King uh, 19, the first 10 uh, verses, Elijah it goes through all these emotions, fear, resentment, guilt, anger, loneliness, and worry. And when he says that Elijah's just like a man like us, that's describing us, isn't it? We go through anger, fear, resentment, worry, and loneliness. And the lesson of Elijah really here is that you don't have to be perfect to pray. Okay? You don't have to be perfect to see answers to your prayers. It's for ordinary people. You know, in the 18th chapter of um, of, uh, of Elijah, uh, uh, first king, Elijah gets alone with God and humbly prays for rain. And the Bible says he prayed seven times for rain. And this is before what happened in 19. And he wouldn't give up. That seven times just means he was persistent. And one day he cloud formed in the sky and he said, y'all better get y'all young brothers and get out of here. And people said, Food that ain't raining in three years. And it started, that cloud got bigger and it started raining and it became a gusher and it almost rained too much. So God uses ordinary people to do extraordinary things, okay? So how can I pray effectively? Number one, let me do this real quick because I'm out of time. I must ask. That almost goes without saying it. And as simple as it is, you know how many people pray don't, don't take the time to ask? They say stuff like, thank you, God. Bless me. If, you don't be, if you're not specific with God, how do you know that God can answer it? I, I um, ran across something that I like so much and I want to share with you. The man said that he, takes a, he, he took a huge sheet of butcher paper and put it up on his wall and has four columns. Date, prayer request, promise, to base my prayers on answer and date. He says it was a real big, big faith building thing. He said he, even the little things he put up there, and when it happened, he said you'd be surprised how those little things built his faith. And he began to expect greater things. And then he began to see greater things, okay? Uh, James 4 and 2 says you have not because you have not. And then I gotta have, number two, I gotta have the right motive. 
when you ask, you don't receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you spend, may spend what you get on your pleasures. Uh oh. What role is a little fool dog used to say? <laughs> <laughs> well, with Scooby Doo, yeah. Scooby -Doo. If you're going to ask in prayer, make sure your motives are right. What do you mean by that? That is not for selfishness, but genuine reason. You know, you know the four. To enrich your life, to bless others, to glorify God, and to line up with God. And then I have to have a clean life. <coughs> The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. That throws people off. What is righteousness? What does righteousness mean? Right standing. Thank you. All it means is being in right standing with God. You know what right standing as a Christian for us means? It just means being in a relationship with God. Having said yes to being in a relationship with God. If you said yes to being in a relationship with God, you're in right standing. Don't get all this this is not whole with this. Righteousness has nothing to do with holiness. Holiness is about your conduct. Righteousness is about who you are in Christ. You see the difference? So he's not saying you have to be holy here. And perfect. We're not talking about perfect, we're talking about righteousness. Let me see over here. Number four. You can read the rest of it yourself. I must ask him faith. I'm a little over. First time this year, brother. I'll be finished in a second. I forgot to give you the cue, didn't I? Let me do the summary. So when do we pray? I should pray when I'm hurting because every area of my life is affected when one of the areas is hurt. And so I need to pray when um, I'm hurting emotionally. I need to pray when I'm hurting physically. I need to pray when I'm hurting spiritually. Who can pray? I can pray. You can pray. And if you feel inferior, if I feel inferior, we need to just remember Elijah. Not the 450 prophets, the big God contest. Remember this man who, who had all these doubts and emotional letdowns and was given to bouts of severe depression and throwing pity parties. Only I'm the one, I'm the only one left. And God looked at him and said, boy, you're not the only one left. There's seven thousand left that bowed down to the line of God. You know, but you get, he, he went through all kind of emotional ups and downs. It's just a man he prayed and things happen. You're just a human. Things, you can pray and things can happen for you too. How can I pray effectively? i got to ask. Sometimes I don't get it because I'm not specific enough. Ask. Be specific. Ask with the right motives. Yes, I want it, but I need to check my motives to make sure that it brings God glory and it helps other people. It's not just something just for me. I need a clean life. Confession means it needs to be a part of my life. Why confession? Because it gets... All those things that block it, all the gifts of God and what God wants from me. And then I get to ask the faith. That means, ask the faith means I ask trusting that God is, knows what's best for me and God's going to give me what's best for me. It might be what I'm asking for. It may be something else that God knows I need more. But this is what I know. That if I ask her, if I bring it into the presence of Jehovah, God Almighty, Prince of Peace, something will happen. Troubles will vanish, I know that. May not vanish the way I want them, but they'll vanish. Hearts are many in the presence of the King.